Let's move forward with this nice paper on deep learning for earth system science. Here we are about deep learning challenges in earth system science. Again, remember I'm being very brief, I'm not reading all the text. The similarities between classical deep learning applications and geoscience applications outlined above are striking, so I skipped some of it. Yet, numerous differences exist, for example, while classical computer vision applications deal with the photos that have three channels, red, green and blue, red, green and blue, hyperspectral satellite images extend to hundreds of spectral channels well beyond the visible range, which often induce different statistical properties to those of natural images. So just to remind ourselves, the classical deep learning and geoscience, geoscience applications, uh, there are lots of memories involved, there are teleconnections involved, so you cannot look at uh, monsoon here and interpret everything just on this data because there are influences coming from far away in you know from the Arctic from the Antarctic from the Pacific from the Atlantic and so on and so forth and a uh, hurricane for example grows based on let's say the heat content in the ocean the heat content takes time to build up but when the hurricane passes it can chew it up very quickly so as it keeps moving forward you cannot just look at uh, what is existing now maybe you need to worry about the build up as well so these memory effects are very important in geoscience applications but these are additional examples of hyperspectral images versus just rgb images for example uh, this includes spatial dependence and interdependence of variables violating the uh, important assumption of identically independently distributed data. So if you have temperature, precipitation, winds and rainfall, they are not independent. They are all related to each other in a very uh, dynamic and thermodynamic way. Additionally, integrating multi-sensor data is not trivial since different sensors exhibit different ima uh, imaging geometries, spatial and temporal resolution, physical meaning, content and statistics. Sequences of multi-sensor satellite observations also come with diverse noise sources, uh, uncertainty levels, missing data and often systematic gaps owing to the presence of clouds and snow, uh, distortion in acquisition, storage, transmission and so on. And you can imagine the scale of the temperatures themselves are very large compared to rainfall and humidity has got uh, this uh, you know uh, exponential dependence on temperature and so on and so forth. In addition spectral, spatial and temporal dimensionalities raise computational challenges. Data volume is increasing and soon it will be necessary to deal with petabytes per day globally. At present the biggest meteorological agencies uh, have to process terabytes per day in near real time often at very high precision so 32 bit or 64 bit further while typical computer vision applications have worked with image sizes of 512 by 512 512 by 512 pixels a moderate resolution around one kilometer global field has uh, sizes of approximately 40,000 by 20,000 pixels that is three orders of magnitude more than what deep learning algorithms have been typically dealing with so this is a nice example here is a machine learning task and here is a science tag a task so you're looking at object classification, you, you easily see a cat and a dog and uh, machine learning can easily do this part or you have uh, some eye resolution and fusion so you have now very easily usable uh, PC based or tablet based or even uh, iPhone based tools of taking fuzzy photos and filling them up magically and here is the ground truth and you can see the reconstruction uh, of uh, what can happen so let me take this call because it's very important uh, sorry I got cut off there so I'm gonna restart uh, uh, I have to give a talk tomorrow so the organizer was calling and unfortunately I need the details the idiot seven send me the details so uh, well, you shouldn't say idiots on record, but when they don't organize properly, it's just a waste of time. So we are looking at an uh, image of 8x8 input, 32x32 32 32 samples and the ground truth. So let's read what the uh, 
caption says four examples of t uh, typical deep learning applications in the left panels the geoscientific frog geoscientific problems they can be applied to in the right panels and we are looking at uh, you know this is the earth science task this is the video prediction and this is the short term forecasting so i cut it and split it actually it's a b c d and then you have uh, you know how to look at it uh, you have to order them properly so object recognition in images uh, links to classification of extreme weather uh, sorry extreme weather patterns using a unified convolutional neural network on climate si simulation data so there are technical details let's not worry about it and b is super resolution application relate to applications relate to statistical downscaling of climate model output again a lot of technical words there and c is video prediction is similar to short term forecasting of earth system variables and the right image is courtesy of Sujan Koirala and la 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 and d here is language translation uh, links to modeling of dynamic time series here and left image courtesy of somebody else so b basically you get the idea that object classification and localization is very easy for RGB images whereas if you think about uh, fusion super resolution and fusion uh, etc you want to use the same idea now for earth system tasks uh, you can see how complicated it is, the scales, but also the details, and it's not just an RGB anymore. You have a f many, many colors, and you want to take kind of a global uh, image and, let's say, uh, somehow produce, in this case, uh, a statistical downscaling and blending for the U.S., and you can see that there are moving systems so it could be a thunderstorm that is going from the west to east and if you just focus your uh, deep learning on local data then you obviously are likely to miss what the history and memory brings to the analysis or actually the uh, event itself what happens here depends very much on uh, how it's been coming along and what happened here for example you could be getting suddenly an infusion of moisture from uh, the Gulf of Mexico that makes this system explode here while it may be much lighter as it comes along here I'm just saying it as an example and here you are looking at a video prediction so time is going in this direction here are two people walking along and the uh, data is given at this point so predict future visual representation it basically linearly or somehow interpolates and says these people working at this speed are going to get out of this frame somehow in uh, the t plus one time step and you want to do that uh, same approach for short-term forecasting as we said it could be just now casting which is let's say a few hours to a few minutes to a few hours or it could be a few days as well so you can see what uh, is meant by that here stacked images in time so time is going in this sense let's say and also in this sense so depends on whether the satellite is doing it or whether model is doing it or whether it's a just a data driven empirical forecast or if it is downscaling of a dynamic forecast that is using past data to interpret observations uh, and model together for the future okay so here is language translator translation sorry I won't say much here so uh, here it's saying softmax and decoder encoder embed these are very technical things and it says uh, he says he loved to eat and then it is some garbled thing here so it has been converted into coherent text so similar thing can happen here in a dynamic time series modeling so real versus predicted humidity values so you can see that humidity can be obviously very variable in time but when you use uh, this kind of learning you may end up with a very smooth looking uh, curve and it is obviously extrapolating and doing something to give you predictions but some places the errors are large and positive or errors large and negative some places it matches very well and so on so this cycle is done very well for example but here you have peak error 
and a, a trough error here. You don't want to produce new peaks and new troughs in predictions that are not there in the data. So the most, just jumping ahead, the most promising near future applications include now casting, that is prediction of the very near future up to two hours uh, in meteorology and forecasting applications uh, anomaly detection and classification based on spatial and temporal context information. So a few examples. A longer term vision includes data driven seasonal forecasting, modeling of spatial long range correlations across multiple time scales, modeling spatial dynamics where spatial context is important, for example fires uh, and detecting teleconnections and connections between variables that a human may not have thought about. Okay, so let's come back and read what the main issues are. This one got interrupted and then I restarted, so I don't know exactly how long it is. Because when you resume a uh, recording, it shows like it may be 17 minutes, but when it removes the gap, uh, the, the blank space, then it may be just 10 minutes or so. So hard to guess. So uh, we'll come back and look at what are the main issues we are dealing with in terms of integration with uh, physical modeling. But this one is about uh, deep learning challenges. So we'll come back and look at some uh, specific challenges we face in applying deep learning to a system science. Okay, so we'll come back and do that. So it'll have a couple of more podcasts at least, but that's okay. This is a nice topic. We'll take our time. Okay.